The Unshackled Waves, episode 130. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company and for those who can view the video version you will see that I've got a special guest with me. I'm here with uh, Amelia Garcia, Deputy Editor of The Unshackled and host of Front and Centre Podcast. Emilio, welcome to The Unshackled Studio. Oh, thank you for having me and uh, it's lovely to have your company as well. Uh, now, the reason that uh, you're here in person is because all the Unshackled editors uh, are getting together this weekend to uh, plan the year ahead, which is very exciting. Yes, absolutely. We have a ton of plans. Uh, the Unshackled is definitely vamping up. I know that you know us from our work, you know, kind of telling you the side of the news that uh, the MSM won't, but uh, you're going to see a lot more coming ahead. So there's some exciting things coming. Now, I thought while I've got you here, it would be uh, good to uh, discuss the week's events because there's, there's always something happening. And it's interesting this week, uh, the news was a lot of uh, continuation of uh, last week. Obviously, the uh, Barnaby Joyce sex scandal has reached its climax with his resignation uh, yes. today. Uh, we have also, this week, we saw Tony Abbott uh, give a speech calling for uh, an immigration uh, cut, which... Uh, was slapped down by his uh, colleagues and has actually led to uh, a bit of an internal brawl in the, the Liberal Party, uh, as if they need, need, needed that as well. Yeah. Uh, and then we also had the, uh, the aftermath of the, the Florida uh, shooting uh, continue, uh, where we're actually starting to see, you know, even though the United States has had uh, all these uh, massacres uh, year after year, uh, there's actually look, looking like they, they might actually have some uh, gun control legislation uh, proposed, which is amazing. Yeah. So uh, we definitely have a lot to cover. So if you want, why don't we start first with the Joyce resignation? Uh, I think a lot of people are just shocked by the fact that he was pushing himself as being this guy who's kind of protecting the, you know, the conservative values which, you know, the Australia cannot get rid of, and we just need to constantly fight for this, is why we can't have gay marriage. And then to see him kind of uh, fooling around with, uh, with another lady and having some illegitimate children, obviously it kind of throws into doubt his integrity. Well, that was uh, one of the aspects that, that people focused on. Uh, to, to be fair, he wasn't as prominent during the, the marriage law postal survey as uh, some others, but uh, he was for a number of years uh, you know, outspoken uh, social conservative, but it wasn't just that. It was also the fact that his uh, staffer, who he had an affair with his media advisor, Vicky Campion, she was shifted first to Matt Canavan's office and then to uh, Damien Drum's uh, office and so there's questions about the appropriate use of uh, taxpayers' money and then there uh, it was it wasn't a good look that it turned out he was uh, living uh, rent free with uh, Vicky Campion after he got kicked out of uh, his home and had to stay with his sister uh, by a apartment owned by his businessman friend uh, Greg Maguire and it, it just got worse from there last week there was that blow up between uh, Malcolm Turnbull who said that you know, Barnaby's actions were appalling mm -hmm. and then Joyce hitting back calling uh, Turnbull's comments uh, inept and he was supposed to be on leave this week and but he did a feature interview with the Fairfax Press mm -hmm. uh, where where he basically said uh, you know oh, please leave us alone and the uh, and the th thing that I think, you know, angered a lot of uh, people was he said he worried that, you know, his uh, child would be uh, viewed as uh, inferior, which a lot of people said, oh, there's, you know, uh, another group of people who you know, <laughs> were worried last year that, you know, their children were being uh, viewed as inferior, which he, he didn't seem to have much self-awareness <laughs> in that. Uh, interview really angered his colleagues because he's, you know, supposed to be, you know, sorting things out and yet he's still uh, in the media and there was... The, the WA National Party, they withdrew their support, which was actually quite meaningless because they have no federal representation and they basically are a different political party. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually, like the Nationals are traditionally social conservative. In WA, they're actually socially progressive. It's quite, it's quite strange. And then there was a uh, Victorian MP, Andrew Broad, sent out an inflammatory tweet saying that, uh, you know, Joyce needs to consider his position. Then he would uh, mm -hmm. move a, a leadership uh, resolution. And then last night there was a 
a formal complaint made to the National Party president of uh, allegation of uh, sexual misconduct against Barnaby Joyce. And today he said that, you know, that was the, the final straw for him. He went out fighting saying, you know, I uh, still believe, you know, firmly in regional Australia. I'm proud of what I've done, but, you know, this was all too much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, well, you covered most of it there. But I will say that uh, obviously there are certain things that uh, have put his situation in a situation where Australians can't ignore it. Uh, essentially, if you want to screw around and you want to be unfaithful, and there's a million things that you can do that really is no one's business but yours, your wife's, and whoever you're boinking. But when we see these things with financial improprieties and also when it, when it relates to uh, preferential treatment, that's when the Australian people have the right to say that this is messed up. So that, that, that would be the first point. And um, lastly, I think that it shows uh, a glimmer of, uh, of integrity for him to at least say, you know, this has been too much. Uh, the Australian people clearly don't want me here anymore. Uh, I don't think that I think that basically I'm, I'm a toxic asset and he pulled himself out. Uh, I don't know if you see it a different way as an Australian with a different uh, kind of focus, but I would say that him deciding finally that he was going to step down and give the Australian people what they want is ultimately at least a little show of integrity. Well, he took a while to get to that decision. There was two weeks where he was digging his heels in saying, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to be uh, forced out. It was clear that the Liberal MPs wanted him to go, but because Nationals are a separate party, party they were utterly powerless to, to do anything about it. And Turnbull's attack was, uh, most people interpret it, thinly veiled, you know, swipe it, uh, Barnaby, you need to go. And there was also a series of leaks uh, during the week uh, designed to damage Joyce that he uh, you know, lobbied hard for um, Susan Lay, uh, who uh, was, was, a, was, if people remember her, she uh, on a... Uh, official ministerial visit bought, uh, bought an apartment for herself, uh, which was viewed as uh, inappropriate. She went and Joyce was one of the people who uh, called for her head uh, the loudest and the yeah. same when uh, Jamie Briggs, uh, a former, uh, he's a former MP now, not just a former minister, uh, was accused of um, sexual impropriety uh, calling for his head as well. So uh, there, there was that pressure uh, be, uh, being applied. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, when you say that there are shows of integrity, a person doesn't have to have integrity in the long run to show integrity. I mean, this obviously, generally politicians will always go for blood, even though they sometimes they know that something really doesn't adhere to their beliefs or something uh, maybe even hypocritical on their behalf. But if there's blood in the water and they can take advantage of it politically, they'll take advantage. My point is that uh, that you know it, it, him stepping aside is um, is okay. Uh, it, this reminds me actually of. Uh, Turnbull today talking outside the White House uh, with a lot of reporters, and they were kind of pushing him on this fact, like, do you want this dude to resign? And uh, it's interesting that he was so passive about it. He was kind of dodging the questions. You know, at some point he kind of said, yes, it was subtle, but he was like, you know, he was appalled by his behavior. So if you're appalled by his behavior and you're so disappointed in him, one would say that you should be comfortable saying, I don't want this guy. To continue in his position, uh, he dodged the subject, and you know, probably in his sleep because it's uh, nighttime in 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 the U.S. Uh, this guy resigns, so it's it's an interesting uh, turn of events. Uh, and of course, this is not the end of the the saga, and uh, Joyce is hoping that it's the end of the media's uh, hounding for him. But uh, Senate estimates uh, starts next week, where Labor are going to start asking questions about you know uh, where, uh, when was Vicky Campion moved around, mm-hmm. you know what did uh, people know? And Turnbull is hoping that now his government can uh, be focused on its, uh, a, as he puts it, uh, jobs in the economy. Uh, <laughs> empty platitude if ever there was one yeah <laughs> uh, but of course the the national party have now got to uh, select a new leader and there's looks like there's going to be a, a smorgasbord of uh, candidates putting their their hand up uh, so far uh, one of the uh, contenders Darren Chester who he was dumped by uh, Barnaby Joyce from cabinet in a reshuffle last year he's uh, mm-hmm. ruled out going for leader he's instead going to uh, back uh, Michael McCormack who is uh, currently the Veterans Affairs Minister from Riverine Reen, uh, New South Wales. Uh, so, uh, obviously, uh, Chester ho- hoping to he'll at least get back into the cabinet and get his old job of Infrastructure Minister back yeah. that... Uh, something, uh, something. 
And there's also two other contenders, David Gillespie in uh, Line, and there's also uh, David uh, Littleproud, who is he's actually only a first-term MP from regional Queensland, though he's already said that him running for the leadership, given that he's only just been promoted to the Cabinet, is unlikely. And there, there's a lot of people have been saying that the reason Joyce was there so long is because there was no one else who had the same you know, profile, and so they're, they're in a leadership vacuum now, the National Party. Right. Uh, I mean, the one thing I will say is that I cannot stand these types of messy political uh, races, essentially when the water is muddied and when there are so many people that are a viable option. Uh, it just makes everything so much more complicated. Ultimately, the person that will uh, that will be Invictus will be the person who just seems least unappealing as opposed to most appealing. And that's that always um, grosses me out. It's not something that I enjoy seeing. Uh, but at this point, you know, this is this is almost just trying to call the election of Donald Trump again. There is just so much that can happen. There are so many um, revelations that can come uh, to light when it comes to this woman and her financial improprieties and when she was moved up in her roles and all these things. Uh, that it, it, at this point, it's it's almost impo- it's almost futile. I feel to try to make any rational estimate as to what's going to happen. And obviously, it's. If the parliament resumes next week, they're, they're not going to have the, the spectacle of uh, uh, Bar- uh, Barnaby and Malcolm sitting up the, mm-hmm. the front together. There's also been a lot of... Uh, uh, Barnaby attacked the the media uh, scrutiny. And, of course, uh, mo- most of this coverage was done by the uh, Sydney Daily Telegraph and mm-hmm. their political editor, Sherry Markson, who she really upset a lot of people by reporting on what most journalists viewed as a private matter. But obviously, you know, she's been vindicated that you know, this was a matter of uh, public interest. And it's, she, she's going full steam ahead. She's pretty fearless. She's also broken today that uh, New South Wales uh, state uh, Liberal uh, Minister uh, Matthew Keane, uh, his uh, ex-girlfriend who worked in Malcolm Turnbull's office, has revealed that uh, he sent her uh, explicit uh, sex messages. And so now people are wondering, are we, you know, is federal politics now going to be, you know, the sex gossip columns? <laughs> it's unbelievable that this has not stopped. There has to be something endemic about politicians who get to an extremely prestigious role and then start behaving this way. I can't imagine that it's all the perverts going into politics, so I have to think that there's something about politics that's corrupting these people. I don't know if these are people that just didn't have a lot of luck in their early days, and the second they saw some power, they saw the opportunity to finally sleep with the pretty girls who wouldn't give them attention otherwise. But honestly, don't be stupid. If you're going to be improper, don't be stupid, I think. Like, if you want to if you want to be sexually improper towards a woman as a politician, can you at least not send her messages that she can later pass on? It seems very stupid. Uh, obviously, that's the lesser point uh, that they're getting caught is a good thing. It's just unbelievable to me that every single week almost we are seeing new instances of these people behaving this way. What is going on? Oh, well, it's great for us in the media. Like, no. uh, it's, it's great uh, uh, news uh, to report. Wonderful. I mean, they, they put blood in the water, and we being the, the hungry piranhas we are, we go for it. But it just, ultimately, I mean, when are we just going to get some people with some real integrity? Especially the conservatives. My God, you're saying that you're so, like, that, that we need to maintain Christian values, and we need to, you know, maintain classic families, and all these things are sacred. And then you go, and you're sending, you know, dick pics to the nearest staffer. Well, you're not really holding anything up. Well, Matt Keane, the, the MP who was reported today, he's actually in the, the moderate faction. So uh, it's, it's still, you know, like obviously uh, pretty cross what he's done, but he doesn't have the same sort of hypocrisy charge that if it was a more conservative Liberal MP. But let's move on to the next topic now, which is uh, Tony Abbott's uh, proposed immigration cut. Mm. Now, he uh, made a speech to the Sydney Institute on Tuesday night saying that uh, for both uh, economic and integration reasons, the annual uh, immigration intake should be cut from 190,000 a year to 110,000 a year. Uh, Now, most people... uh, uh, viewed this as, uh, you know, Tony Abbott, he is, you know, obviously, you know, wanting attention to, you know, cause, uh, you know, f- uh, friction in the in the federal government. And it seemed that 
uh, if that was his goal, then he achieved it because he got a strong rebuke from uh, pretty much all the senior ministers in the government. As mm. Scott Morrison went in hard saying that you know this would devastate the budget, and also said, I don't recall you know Tony Abbott when he was prime minister, you know, proposing such a uh, an idea, mm -hmm. and also Matthias Cormann, who his is himself an immigrant to uh, Australia, so, you know, perhaps doesn't like the idea of okay. uh, cuts to immigration. He also uh, uh, disregarded the idea. Even Peter Dutton, who he only last week uh, hinted at immigration cuts, uh, dismissed the idea, saying, you know, we need skilled migrants. And uh, Trade Minister Steve Trove, he eviscerated the the idea as well and so and you know Abbott's you know he he's not he hasn't uh you know take uh, taken that rebuke lying down on right. Wednesday he you know hit back on radio saying you know Scott seems to be Scott Morrison seems to be listening to his uh, department rather than thinking for himself. And today even uh, published an op-ed, which an op-ed is normally a well thought out. Uh, <laughs> A written statement he yes. said that you know scott morrison should listen to me because you know i have experience in uh winning elections oh. and <laughs> at the moment you know we're losing pretty badly so you know wouldn't you want to listen to a winner yeah that, that sounds like a really stupid opinion to to put to put on paper uh i think this is a classic case of just stirring shit for the sake of it uh i don't think you know the the, the proposition i think is both so moderate that it won't pass because it's just not not sexy enough and and just kind of spicy enough to get people riled up it was clearly a call for attention i don't think that there's any that he has any intention to really move forward with any of this and it just seems like like it's it's just a, a whistle it's just basically look at me give, give me attention give me media space uh there are uh you know this is a time where i can use this media attention so i mean it's just it, I almost don't even want to preoccupy myself with his comments. Well, he didn't just make the speech. He uh, leaked on the day that he was giving the speech the, the contents of it to the Daily Telegraph. Mm -hmm. And he also appeared on the, the Bolt Report that night to, you know, spruik his uh, proposals. So, you know, he, he, he wanted it to uh, the senior people in the government to, to take notice. And even people who um, do agree that, you know, immigration to Australia is a concern believe that he was attacking the wrong type of immigration, yes. that, you know, we want... Yeah, you know, we don't want to cut the skilled migration numbers. Like yeah. we probably more want to look at the humanitarian intake because mm. you know a lot of the you know refugees we're we're taking in uh, you know, aren't integrating very well. It's uh, we haven't just had you know Islamic uh, terror threats, which our uh, security agencies seem to be constantly thwarting. But uh, where where I am now and where you are at the moment, yeah. Melbourne, we're um, you know suffering through the the African summer crime wave, right. which is you know, destroying a lot of uh, suburbs around the place. So yeah. there, there's a discussion to be had about immigration, but Absolutely. I think making it as broad as possible, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, yeah, he opened himself up to uh, criticism on that front. Yeah, he opened himself to criticism by being a, an idiot, essentially. I mean, here's one of the things. We can talk about immigration, because not talking about it just because we want to see like wonderful people is a fool's errand. Uh, we know now that there are certain people that come from certain places who have certain ideologies that are antithetical to the way that we choose to live our life. Now, people say that this is uh, racist or Islamophobic. Well, not necessarily. Uh, a lot of people have uh, have concerns with people from Russia or from people from Kosovo. These are it. It has to do more with the ideologies that they hold and the way that they run their daily lives. And for example, right now with the with the African youth wa youth uh, wave. It seems like people don't want to talk about it because it just seems like just to just to notice that there are the, there, there's this group of young people that are creating all these issues just to notice that they're doing this because they're black is an act of bigotry. And I think what one of the messages that we're kind of failing to get across is we don't give a shit that they're black. We give a shit what they're doing. We don't care about I mean, if people are coming here and they're black and they integrate into society and they contribute, we are happy to have them here. But anyone who is causing us problems, we are going to bring this to light. And this is if they're from Africa or if they're from Russia, if they're creating problems within Australia, we have every right to say we're not okay with this. So that's one part of the equation which he completely ignored, which would have been an intelligible 
uh, an intelligent rather argument that he can make and that you know would at least get a, a debate going that is important that, and that adds to the conversation cutting skilled migration which is what australia needs which Australia is an old population. It's a small population. Uh, we're not really keeping up uh, with uh, with all the with all the um, jobs that we need to fill. It makes sense. We want good immigrants here. We want immigrants that adhere to our way of life, who are skilled and who are contributing to the economy and to the society. We want this. So he went for the completely wrong end. And really, what he just ended up doing is looking like a fool and taking up our time with a stupid conversation, which you can't really ignore as a politician. I get that. But it's like, don't waste our time. Please, please bring to light things that need to be brought. Uh, and of course, the political message from uh, senior members of the government was to Tony Abbott, uh, please uh, piss off. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's it's clear that, I mean, the, the media, you know, loves, you know, leadership speculation. That's why they've been after, you know, Barnaby the last two weeks. But the the Liberal Party, Liberal, or at least the Liberal Party room, is rock solid behind mm. uh, Mal- Malcolm Turnbull. I, I mean, there's the possibility if, you know, the polls are, you know, really dire, uh, before the next election, they might panic and get rid of him. But yeah. uh, he, he has the the overwhelming support of you know the party room, and it's worth pointing out that most of the the ministers who criticised him, uh, you know Morrison, uh, Dutton, and Cormann, they're all conservatives. You know right. they're not they're not from the the, the far left mm-hmm. of the party. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, it's it just it just. Um... Kind of, kind of ridiculousness. I mean, at this point, we're not even we're not even preoccupying ourselves with with real issues. It's all about what it what the issue reflects and how it how our constituent how our constituents will react to it. There's no progress in this. Well, there's also the reason why you know Abbott feels that he's justified to you know make these uh, comments is because yes, the the government is behind in the polls. Uh, mm-hmm. It's up to uh, 27 news poll losses now, and Malcolm Turnbull used 30 news poll losses to justify uh, in- deposing Tony Abbott. Mm-hmm. So you know Tony Abbott is saying you know you ignore me at your peril, like you know you're losing, like you know surely you'd be you know wanting some advice and yes i i mean the the, the turnbull government has to do um something different and uh, obviously uh you know citizenship dramas and yes. <laughs> uh you know deputy prime minister's sex scandals it's no, it, it, it seems to be their their greatest weakness is that there's just a new scandal around the corner and no <laughs> no no amount of sort of better policy could fix it yes absolutely and i mean that, that that's ridiculous i mean obviously if you have just bad people in the government people are going to see them as as you know in a negative light uh but i do think that there's this one thing and i hope you'll agree with me that maybe sometimes in australia we can just let people finish their term i just i i, I feel there's this there's this aura of this person will reach a certain point they will be unpopular enough that we can push them out and replace them and that's not a good thing because what it what it basically does is it leads to political cowardice. Right now, uh, uh, Turnbull is not going to do anything that the country needs that may be seems may be seen as controversial because he needs to vamp up his his base. He needs to make himself look more popular, which essentially is going to give us a a, a lot of empty platitudes and no progress. So how about we just let people continue to do their things and only push them out if they're doing like something that's criminally negligent uh, it just it just it shocks me right now that it is so easy to push people out and replace them just because they're unpopular yeah. well that's the way that our political system is set up if a uh, prime minister loses the majority support in his party room that's it he's he's finished it it does happen more frequently these days i just think it's because we've had poor political leadership that's uh we you know we haven't had uh, like a really you know strong leader since John Howard, and that's why he lasted uh, full uh, four ter- uh, four terms of, yeah. of government. And so, Hallelujah. yeah, I, I just think we need you know we we need the the politicians who are coming in now to you know be of as good a quality that yeah. uh, you know there's not going to be this you know constant state of chaos, and we're also not getting MPs who are just going to panic and uh, you know uh, knife a leader at, <laughs> at the next news poll. Essentially, I mean, this this cut and run, this this idea of uh, it's not working out. Let's just move on to the next thing. I just think it's actually more harmful to us than we realize. And if we could just get past this, if we could just allow people to, I know sometimes there there will be dips in popularity, but can we just let someone 
play something out, and if it doesn't work way into the presidency, into the uh, into the government's um, time, then fine, let's let's get rid of them. But if if not, like just let them stay, because otherwise we're not doing anything. We're just walking a line, not getting on anyone's bad side, and seeing how far we can make it, how long we can stay in power. This is not good, and everyone is always looking for blood. To, to get them out of power. It just seems it just seems like uh, something that's antithetical to progress. One other major story in Australia this week, which I forgot to mention in my introduction, was, mm. oh, was pretty much the, a sad uh, story that uh, in the Northern Territory town of uh, Tennant Creek, a two-year-old uh, uh, Aboriginal girl was uh, raped and had to be flown to uh, Adelaide to uh, receive treatment and you know this you know really shocked people that you know what you know type of person you know does such a horrific act but what angered people even more that uh this the the home that she that this girl was staying in had been there there were 16 uh you know notifications to uh child protection authorities Mm -hmm. and uh, she was also given back the the girl once she'd been released from hospital back to the mother who lived at the premises where uh, she was raped and it's and people are you know just amazed that you know our authorities you know child protection authorities are so adverse to you know removing uh, indigenous children from dangerous situations because you know they'll be accused of racism and creating a new stolen generation. Uh, the, the the ridiculousness of the point that we've gotten to in order to protect uh, the the view of ourselves as virtuous people is ridiculous. Now it's having real life consequences. The fact of the matter is that there should be nothing but facts behind your decisions. The fact that a small child who you are responsible to take care of is in a dangerous situation and you don't interject because you think that people might think that you're a racist, that just makes you a shitty person. That makes you worse than a racist. I mean, a racist, you know what? They are horrible people, but at least they're true to themselves in some sense. You are just letting people stay in extremely dangerous situations because you want to be viewed as a wonderful, glorious person. I think it's, it's it's one of the more shocking, horrible stories. And I would say... I mean, where, whose heads are we going to cut off? I mean, where, where, who are we going to, who are we going to make accountable to this? Yes, it's true that it's law enforcement at, at large, but I want to know who are the individuals who receive this, receive this information, and then made the conscious decision to let the girl stay in the situation, and then finally, once she was sexually assault, assaulted, at, at being a two-year-old, which is just disgusting. I mean, you can imagine the 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 environment that she's in and the people she's surrounded by, and then given back into that same same. Uh, environment. It's criminal. Well, e- uh, even after this horrific event, the the left are still saying, oh, you know, we need to have the policy of, you know, family preservation and, you know, remember the stolen generation. They're still spouting the, the, the same lines. And it really, you know, makes me so angry that, you know, these people believe that, you know, because... You know, a you know child you know happens to be born uh, of Aboriginal descent. That you know they they always have to be you know forced to live in you know an isolated, primitive, and you know often a dangerous environment where you know we wouldn't you know think that's acceptable for a white child. Yeah. Like I don't get this obsession with why does the left think that you know being with their you know so-called you know culture and uh you know letting their languages you know so it's you know so important isn't isn't it racism to you know uh believe that you know because a child's born aboriginal they you know should live a substandard life that that doesn't seem fair i mean you know that is and all of this criticism is you know about a so-called stolen generation is you know done by you know inner city uh indigenous activists and exactly. left who you know they enjoy all the benefits of you know the the white man's uh you know medicines and, right. and technologies but they want to condemn those in remote communities to basically you know a substandard uh of living the issue with leftists is that there is this identity of there's this 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 um, appeal to identity, and no appeal to the individual. So we need to consider everybody who is a minority as the whole of the community and never as an individual. So the stolen generation is obviously an extremely awkward thing to bring up, and it has so much emotional backing 
that to kind of argue against um, argue against any argument that leftists are using the stolen generation as a base of uh, it, it is considered an act of bigotry. And so it's kind of hard to push back against that. But essentially what we need to say is that it's completely different situations. Grabbing a child whose piece of garbage mother is keeping her in a horrible situation where she is being raped at the age of two and taking her into a good situation is not racism. But what is an absolutely abhorrent act is saying, we're going to return because we want to preserve the family, we want to preserve the, the culture because, you know, us, you know, guilty white people are just so awful and we need to con let them do it. It's like, no, no, no. Let's not, let's not rack this up to race. Let's not rack this up to uh, aboriginals versus uh, Australians. It's, it's stupid. If an aboriginal is taking good care of their children, of course, of course, they should never have anybody take their children away from them. No one is saying that. But what they're saying is essentially if we want to take a child from a person who happens to be Aboriginal because they're terrible to their children, then we're kind of playing back into the, the, the stolen generation. And it's not the same thing. It's not. And it's, it's, it's awful to see leftists take over the conversation with these loud allegations of bigotry and, and these completely uh, factually incorrect uh, and, and intellectually uh, lacking arguments and, and getting their way. And why racism? Like that, you know, this horrific event, it had nothing to do with this fact. In fact, it was white people uh, being afraid of being labelled racist is what has led to this situation. And the Tennant Creek where this, uh, you know, rape uh, occurred, I mean, uh, it's been reported now that, you know, that has, you know, horrific levels of, you know, violence mm -hmm. and uh, alcohol mm -hmm. abuse, yeah. and it has the, the highest uh, police to civilian ratio uh, in the country. And, right. you know, there's uh, a lot of people, you know, in around that community are saying that, you know, it's, you know, the community that needs to take the, the blame for this. I mean, yeah. you know, how is it, you know, the fault of, you know, of, you know, people, you know, white people just, you know, in the city going about their business? Absolutely. That, okay, according to the left, what you said, just to notice the facts and the statistics are in its, in its own right an act of bigotry, which is ridiculous. Essentially, here's what we know. Here are the statistics. Here's, here's the development of that area as compared to other areas. No, you're a bigot. You're a bigot because you noticed the reality of this place. And let us be clear. Let us be clear that we, we, it, it's not like we're labeling aboriginals as being a certain way. The, the, the idea here is not to say that there is a problem that we consider uh, aboriginals uh, to inherently have a problem. That's what we need to make really clear. What we want to make, what we want to happen is for people to be treated as individuals and communities to be also be treated as an independent community and not as a whole. I'm sure there are perfectly healthy Aboriginal communities in which children don't have to be taken out of their homes for their own safety, in which children are growing up educated, intelligent, contributing to society. But the fact of the matter is that there are communities where there's alcoholism and rape and uh, abuse and to, to, to say that we, uh, to notice the fact that this is happening is an act of bigotry is ridiculous. Because if it were a community, a rural community, and it was all white people, and there was alcoholism and abuse and rape, no one would bat an eye taking children out of that toxic situation. I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, I have to pick you up there because yeah. this stolen generation or fear of creating a stolen generation has actually seeped into uh, child protection authorities dealing with uh, white families. Uh, mm. there, there's an inquest uh, uh, at, the, at the moment into this uh, ice addicted mother whose two uh, infant children uh, died. Uh, I can't recall how many notifications mm. uh, family and community services received, but it was numerous and they mm. were uh, all ignored because of this uh, family preservation policy. So it seeped into you know, s suburban Australia where uh, a new, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, uh, generations of children, it's mm. creating a, you know, a condemned generation to, you know, uh, to be in this uh, abusive and, uh, you know, d uh, downtrodden situ situation. Yeah. And it, it's self-perpetuating becomes intergenerational because, you know, if there's, you know, problems at home, mm -hmm. uh, 
when, when children are being raised, then those children uh, begin to develop problems in their teen years, uh, you know, uh, might act up at school, commit mm -hmm. crimes, and, you know, they go on to, you know, be bad parents themselves. And so that's why, you know, child protection authorities, they have to be decisive and, you know, make the decision, you know, if, if the children are young to you know, have them uh, adopted out where, you know, yeah. they've got a chance to, you know, a normal life and, mm -hmm. you know, can be, you know, raised the, the way you and I were. Yes, absolutely. Listen, the, the issue is, first of all, I mean, one point, uh, obviously a human mind is basically a computer. It, 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 it gets programmed and if it grows up in toxic environments, it takes a very specific type of person to leave that environment and and do very well for themselves you always have the 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 you know stellar examples of people who grew up in in horrible situations and finally um managed to make a, a very good life for themselves but the fact of the matter is that if you grow up in a toxic situation if you don't have role models and if you don't have an education it's really hard for you to get ahead now another point is that what child protective services is doing is criminal like, it, there's no other way to, to, to state it. This, the, the fact that they're trying to, to, to be sensitive to racial issues, that now, apparently, racial sensitivities of people in the frickin' CBD allows children to stay in a place where they will be around alcoholism and rapists. H how can anyone ever say that that's okay? And what they'll say is that th this is an argument of bigotry. That how dare we say this? How dare we say that they're in 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 dangerous situations? And we'll point at, we'll point at the figures. We'll say th th these these are the actual facts. And you'll say no, these are assumptions that you're making because you're a racist, because you're a neo-Nazi and a fascist and whatever. And it's it's awful because what they're doing is basically in their conquest, in the in their search to be labeled as the moral authority of the world and the woke wonderful human beings that they are. They are letting children. And, and not even children, young people, adults, people with mental illness, all these people are continuing to be ignored and, and to live horrible lives and to have horrible things happen to them just because they think that they're doing the virtuous thing. And it is absolutely criminal. And of course, the big story over in the United States continues to be the, the aftermath of the, the Florida school right. shooting. And... In the United States, they've had so many uh, school shootings or mm. other um, you know, types of mass shootings as well, and it's never led to any action on gun control. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's really bizarre that this time, and this was not even you know, the worst no. uh, mass shooting in U.S. history, that there, appear, there appears to be that there, there might be some action on uh, firearms legislation, Donald Trump has said he'll ban uh, or issue a, a directive uh, for uh, bump stocks, which uh, mm -hmm. have uh, semi-automatic weapons turned into uh, machine guns, mm -hmm. and, and that he'll also uh, raise the, the age of purchasing firearms to 21, yeah. and also introduce uh, instant uh, background checks. And it's 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 really bizarre because it's there's always been no no action after every uh, massacre, but it's weird that this is uh, this this is the one. And uh, with Trump, because like yes, he like did receive the endorsement of the the NRA, but he's also you know an ex Democrat who was in yes. favor of uh, you know gun control, and he's not a traditional Republican. And so I think the the old Democrat in Trump has come out this week and that's why he's supported this and a few other Republican lawmakers have sort of conceded or oh, maybe you know we you know need, need to look at these um, you know re restrictions and yeah. it's just been you know like, like I said it's incredible to watch that you know wow like yeah. all of a sudden the tide is turning well, uh, several things have come together this one time that make this a uh, unique situation first of all having conservatives in power makes uh makes the conversation a lot easier for the base for the gun loving base of america to kind of be able to to to, to swallow th this rhetoric because anytime a democrat even hints at any type of regulation for guns it's you know the freaking liberals are coming for my guns so that changes the conversation a little bit another thing is that the 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 shooting happened in an incredibly democratic area and so any every i mean uh, most of the kids in that school and most of the parents voted well not the kids because they can't vote but i mean they're uh, most of the kids are in families that voted for hillary clinton uh, almost overwhelmingly that's also a contribution uh the school also happens to be highly political they have a, a really active uh news 
organization within the school. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that subject in a little bit because uh, the the leader of that um, news program is uh, a, the the center of a pretty uh, crazy conspiracy theory. That's a story for a little bit later. Uh, but a lot of things have happened that that are unique to the situation. And so, uh, first of all, conservatives feel comfortable to to talk about gun control. So that's a big step in the right direction. And uh, also, conservatives need to speak to um, about guns to liberals because it happened in a liberal controlled state. Um, well, at least uh, intellectually. Uh, so, so this obviously opens the debate up to a far more left leaning uh, form of gun control. Uh, Donald Trump tweets out all of these uh, common sense uh, gun regulations, which had Obama proposed them, the, Demo- the Republicans would be up in arms. But since it was uh, Trump who proposed them, Republicans are either quiet or sort of, uh, you know, passive endorsements. Uh, and uh, Democrats can't say this is wonderful because it's Trump and ev- anything Trump does is bad, even if he does a good thing. You know, he, he could save a puppy and it would be, uh, you know, it would be an act of bigotry I- in the eyes of, uh, of CNN. So there are all these things that are coming together that, that make the situation very, very unique. Uh, but what you still see is that actually the, the left right now is acting in the most heinous way. They are taking these kids, these traumatized kids who saw... Uh, their friends being murdered and who clearly have obviously very strong emotional reactions to this because they went through something horrible and they're throwing them out as experts and they're sending them to town hall meetings to to abuse uh, people who actually know what they're talking about and to yell at them to put them in uncomfortable situations they also have kids appearing regularly on round tables to talk about their ideas on gun control which why would we be listening to these kids i'm sorry I, everyone sympathizes with with what they went through but my god to say that you saw a gun go off and now you're an expert is 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 ridiculous and yeah, it's the just... expression that uh, being a victim doesn't make you an expert yeah exactly like i i you know i got in a car crash a couple of years ago that does not make me an expert in in road safety it, quite the opposite in that in that sense obviously it doesn't say anything negatively about the kids but they are kids. They are children. And if you actually listen to the rhetoric, I, I, would, I would encourage anyone who's watching to go on YouTube and look up CNN, uh, even if it's the first time that you've done it, to actually look up a CNN video and not a commentary on the CNN video, and look at these kids' arguments. And I don't think anybody in their right mind would say that these kids are making an, a, a very good argument. They have no idea about the figures, the facts, the statistics, what is driving uh, uh, gun uh, violence, what, what, what the overwhelming amount of murders um, uh, are used, uh, what the overwhelming amount of weapons that are used to commit murders are, and they have no idea. All they're saying is, the next time there's a shooting, it's on the Republicans' hands. And you ask, well, how? Uh, w- what have they failed to do? It's like, oh, you're just saying that because you're trying to shut me down because you're, uh, you know, evil conservative who who thinks that uh, the children have no, you know, it goes into the the worst pit of stupidity. So actually, I'm seeing a lot of very immoral behavior on on behalf of uh, the mainstream media and the left. Uh, if that can surprise you, tremendously. And, and that's ironic that this time they may actually get what they want. And look, I'm a libertarian, so you know nobody supports you know the right to, um, you know, bear arms and right to own firearms, right. you know, more than me. It's I, I don't. Th- yeah, I've never viewed this situation in, in America where these massacres keep happening mm-hmm. as you know simple you know gun control will solve it because it seems to be it's a, a culture cultural thing in the United States that okay. you know if you're you know a, a psychopath <laughs> and you know you want to uh, make a statement then you know doing a mass shooting in a school is the way to you know make you know notor- notoriety. It seems yeah. to be that. You know, there's been copycat after copycat. Yeah, pretty much, this all started with Columbine. That was yes. a big, you know, major, a major one in the in the United States. And that it, it, it just it, it seems to have you know snowballed since then. And mm-hmm. uh, the people point out that oh, it hasn't happened in Australia because of you know gun control. That's mm-hmm. a, that's a bit a bit you know simplistic. We don't have you know a history of uh, you know school attacks here. Even even when we did have you know mm-hmm. relaxed. Uh, you know, gun laws, you know, there was never, there was never, you know, s- school shootings, you know, there were, right. you know, obviously, you know, massacres, mm-hmm. um, you know, but, you know, not in the same frequency as the United yeah, States. Yeah, not statistically significant. So, uh, I mean, I, I would disagree with you on, on the point, like, uh, obviously, you respect the right to bear arms of the Americans, because it's a constitutional right. Uh, another thing is that, statistically speaking, the amount of murders that are caused by people with guns going into a school and shooting it up 
is insignificant. So to try to affect a a whole body uh, legislatively based on something that happens 0.3% uh, of the time, uh, it just makes no sense. So what the left is saying is the only way to stop this is to confiscate all weapons. And especially they say like se uh, semi-automatic weapons, things like this. Um, first point, they think that semi-automatic weapons means that you pull the trigger and several shots come out, yeah. which is not the case. You Semi-automatic basically means that it's not, you know, one of those old-timey things that you need to put the put the powder in. So semi-automatic yeah. means that you can shoot, like, you know, 30, yeah. like, standard bullets instead of, exactly. like, 6 or 10. Yeah, well, exactly. Essentially, it means that you shoot, and then another bullet comes into the, mm. into the I don't know what you call it, the, the, the part I, where it shoots yeah. from. Machine guns aren't legal. They're not. Of course they're not legal. I mean, because who, who in their right mind would need a machine gun? But they think because semi-automatic weapons are legal, they don't understand that a gun, that a handgun is a semi-automatic weapon. Because you don't need to recharge it every single time. You know, it kind of does the process itself. So that's a really important thing. The overwhelming amount of murders by a, uh, by a gun are by a handgun. As we're saying, we need to, we need to ban these big, scary-looking guns. But why? What is that going to do? It, it, it causes a tiny percentage of the school uh, uh, of the of the murders in the U.S. That's one point. What what a lot of people are saying is the 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 ban on uh, what do, what do you call the bump stocks? Bump stocks. That makes sense. That just makes pragmatic sense. And the NRA supports that. Yeah, because it just well, why do you need to have a legal thing that can turn a gun? into a legal gun and, and allow it to, to yeah, have the and, function of and, an illegal gun. It the, the ban on machine guns. Essentially. And so uh, that's common sense. And people are saying, essentially, this is not going to stop school shootings, but it's going to save lives the next time there's a school shooting. Because this kid, you know, whoever goes in and starts shooting, he can only put one bullet out at a time. And that's, that's significant. That's, that's actual progress. These are things that we can implement that are actually going to have real-world consequences. What the left is trying to do now is they're saying, no, the only way is to get rid of all guns. First of all, impossible. You you tell me if you're going to go into Texas and take people's guns away, if well, they're going to take that line down. There's 300 million guns in the United States. But there's more. Like... <laughs> yeah, there's 300 million people in the U.S. There's more guns than that. It's, it's, it's just absurd. And if, so the first point would be that it's not going to happen. Again, you go into you go into Texas and try to take people's guns, see, if, see how that goes. Um and another point is that the, 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 the problem seems to be, not to as large a degree as a lot of conservatives are saying, but it, it is a problem, is that there's no red flag system in place. So this kid, for example, whatever his name is, Cruz, that ugly motherfucker, um, he had apparently a history of acting in really horrible ways. He was commenting things on... YouTube channels about being a professional school shooter. He, uh, you know, was in his in his Instagram account that no one wants to admit on the right that he had a MAGA hat on. Not that it really changes anything, but he did, and he had guns on there. And he was he and, and the police went several times to visit him because of the antisocial personality uh, behaviors that he was presenting. And the kid was able to get a gun. So the issue isn't really that his that we need to infringe on everyone's rights to get a gun. It's that why isn't there a way to make sure. That, that these people who have clear red flags, they're the ones that don't get the guns. So there should be some kind of system in place where I am concerned about, you know, Tim Wilms has been displaying some really, uh, yeah, some really shady um, behavior. So I'm going to tell the government and they're going to they're gonna basically make it so it's hard for you to get a gun. That makes sense. They'll read the unshackled. I, wouldn't, I would not put a gun in your hands. <laughs> uh, no, but that, that makes sense, right? That's something that, 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 that I think people could, could come to a conclusion that that's a good idea. But why, why really, why 99% of people, 99.9% .9 of people who have guns in the U.S. are using them legally. So why do we need to get rid of their guns? Yeah, and le uh, leading up to this school shooting, there was a lot of failings. Like, obviously, you know, people, you know, didn't pick up that this, you know, kid was troubled. On, yep. And he was reported to the FBI and the, the investigation Jeez. seemed to go cold. And also, uh, Trump has proposed, uh, you know, arming, like having, you know, armed guards outside yeah. of, you know, schools, which is, you know, why wouldn't you? But, uh, you know, liberals, are, and this is why they keep losing the, yeah. you know, the, the gun argument is because 
uh, uh, conservatives are able to say you want to take away you know all, all our guns which they secretly do they won't say it <laughs> exactly. but, uh, it's true it's like they say oh no we only want to restrict these but you know you, you you would get you would try and you know get rid of all guns if you could like that that's your ultimate goal did you see the town halls when anyone made any reference to getting rid of all guns like the applause that there was like that's not generating any confidence on behalf of yeah. the conservatives that, that, that's why they keep losing and yeah. you know uh, obviously they don't like the you know that uh, our solution is that uh you know to protect you know students from a gun attack you need you know a gun to de- de- defend them that yeah. uh, they uh, there seems to be this view that, oh, you know, we shouldn't need to have, you know, armed guards. But if it's going to prevent a mass shooting, <laughs> like, you know, that, that's what you have. Like, you know, I that, that's like saying to, you know, prevent uh, burglaries. Like, I shouldn't have to, <laughs> exactly. you know, lock my lock front my door. door. You know, my community should be safe enough that I should be able to leave, you know, everything open. Like, that's exactly. the logic. Exactly. And th- this reminds me of a bill that was trying to be put in to law in, uh, I don't remember what state. But they essentially want to ban bulletproof glass in lower uh, income communities because they considered it racist. And they said, no, to have these glasses, essentially it, it, it sends the message like, no, this is, a, this is a majority black or majority Latino community. And so you need bulletproof glass or we're going to get rid of it because it's racist. And people are saying like, bitch, it's like, I'm in danger. Like if you take that away, they'll shoot me in my face. And the same thing goes for this argument. The, I, I like to say not the left, the leftists, because remember, the left, I believe, they're perfectly right, reasonable people sometimes, uh, but the leftists, they don't make arguments based on facts. They make arguments based on what they have established as uh, the proper virtuous way to think and an appeal to emotion. And so I was discussing this actually yesterday. I was with some friends who are kind of on the left, and... I said it just makes sense, you know, there's a lot of places where, where there are armed guards that you wouldn't even think of, you know, there's the, in shopping malls and uh, jewelry stores, for example, and, uh, you know, all these different places have, have armed guards and you, you kind of walk past them, you don't even notice them. Um, and they're saying, well, the solution isn't more guns. I'm saying, well, it's, why not? Why not? I mean, if there's a person, if, if, if all these schools are in danger of having some deranged person come in and have complete power in terms of, in terms of firepower to, 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 um, assert themselves over the students and kill as many people as they want, why doesn't it make sense to have a person in the entrance who is tr- a trained professional to have a firearm with him? Uh, and they're like, well, we shouldn't have to. It's like, yeah, we shouldn't have to. Of course. No, no, no. I, w- I wish we shouldn't have to do anything. I don't. I wish I didn't have to pay for, for water or internet. I wish I, I you know, I wish that, that I just, uh, you know, made enough money to, you know, have a yacht by picking berries. But the fact of the matter is the should doesn't matter. We live in the real world. And yes, we shouldn't need to live in fear in our schools. This is true. Um, but a lot of things shouldn't be, but they are. So what are we going to do to fix them? I don't, want, I don't want to sit here and virtue signal my way into oblivion. All right. Yes, we can say guns are horrible. and you, 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 That's a valid point of view. If you don't like guns, then don't like them. But I wonder how many people would say, all right, if there's the school shooter in the school where your child goes, would you have the same point of view? Would you be like, oh, at least there wasn't another gun in the building, because that would have been awful. Come on. Well, the stories we discussed today, they, they will obviously uh, shape uh, the, the near future. So I've enjoyed uh, discussing them with you in person today, uh, Emilio. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Tim, for having me in person. And thank you to all your viewers. And uh, I'll make the uh, end of show announcements uh, now. Uh, we're going to be at the Free Speech Rally tomorrow, which uh, is organised by the newly formed Australian Freedom of uh, Speech Movement. Uh, so it's at the State Library of Victoria uh, on February 24th at 1pm. By the time this podcast is uploaded, uh, it'll probably have already occurred. So uh, I hope that everyone uh, viewing and listening uh, attended. And uh, let's... Uh, let, uh, we're, we're not sure if uh, we'll get any uh, Antifa in, a- action yeah. uh, tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, I look like a lefty, so I'll just, if, if anything happens, I'll just go on the other side. And, and we've got a lefty libertarian speaker, so hopefully they can <laughs> help <laughs> us out there. F- f- offend Antifa off. So, exactly. You know, if you see us uh, again on Monday, it means that we we're fine. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. 
and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.